Inner Visions and Running Trains, Baba Fakir Chand and the Tibetan Book of the Dead. People say that my form manifests to them and helps them in solving their worldly as well as mental problems, but I do not go anywhere, nor do I know about such miraculous instances. Baba Fakir Chand you cannot travel the path until you have become the path itself. Buddha One of the most remarkable aspects about the Tibetan Book of the Dead, or more accurately speaking, the Bardo Todol, is the principle that whatever one perceives during the dying process is ultimately illusory. Experiences of seeing inner light, hearing wondrous melodies and feeling sensations of being out of the body, according to the Bardo Todol, are but momentary reflections of one's own psychological condition. As such, they are not to be valued in and of themselves, since they cannot, by their nature, reveal the ultimate truth, but only, even if magnificently, obscure it. The reason for this is simple, if profound. Whatever one sees in the dying process is projections from one's own self. Since this self, soul, ego in Buddhism is the root cause of man's suffering, anything that reinforces, glamorizes, or even elevates its status is misleading. The key to enlightenment in Mahayana Buddhism, unlike Christianity, is not salvation of the soul, but rather its annihilation as a continued sensation. Therefore, the Tibetan Book of the Dead is a practical text on how to carry out the process of death to its terminal apex, extermination of the individual self. At first glance, this may seem a bit extreme, especially to those steeped in Western religions. Yet, in light of Buddha's teachings, it is perfectly consistent with his philosophy which views death, real death, in a very positive light. What is perhaps most intriguing about the Tibetan Book of the Dead, at least from a scientific perspective, is its thoroughly rational and skeptical character. Although the text does instruct the neophyte to accept the clear void light as one's own, it does not describe in precise terms what that light is. Instead, it concentrates on what the light is not. It is not anything that can be seen, heard, touched or felt, even on a higher or more elevated plane of awareness. It is, on the contrary, the suchness or context or spectrum out of which all things operate, but in and of itself cannot be grasped as any particular thing. Thus it is always identified through negation. Neti neti, not this, not that, or through negative images, emptiness, void, vacuity, etc. Without a foundation in the conventional truth, the significance of the ultimate cannot be taught. Without understanding the significance of the ultimate, liberation is not achieved. By a misperception of emptiness, a person of little intelligence is destroyed, like a snake incorrectly seized, or like a spell incorrectly cast. Nagarjuna, the fundamental wisdom of the Middle Way. It is, if we can describe it at all, no thing. The implications for the dying Lama are clear. Do not accept whatever may arise in the intermediate stage just after death, for each apparition betrays its real origin, imputing a sense of reality and permanence upon something which has neither. Realize, rather, that nirvana is the source from which all visions arise, and is therefore itself not a vision. Truth is the condition from which all conditions arise. Surprisingly, one of the more lucid insights on the philosophy of the Tibetan Book of the Dead comes from a Hindu mystic named Baba Fakir Chand, who, apparently, was not familiar with the original Tibetan text or its English translation. 
Although Fakir was not conversant with the Bardo Todol, he was nevertheless steeped in its philosophy as taught to him by his guru, Shiv Bharat Lal of Gopiganj. Fakir Chand, like his Lama counterparts, spent much of his life in meditation, attempting to consciously go through the dying process in order to prepare himself for his final exit. However, unlike others of his kind, Fakir left a detailed account of his some 70 plus years of meditation, ranging from 3 to 12 hours daily, which led up to his enlightenment. The result is a richly detailed account that provides a thorough understanding of inner visions. None of all these deities or spiritual beings has any real individual existence any more than have human beings. It is quite sufficient for thee, i.e. the deceased percipient, to know that these apparitions are the reflections of thine own thought forms. They are merely the consciousness, content, visualized by karmic agency as apparitional appearances in the intermediate state. Airy nothings woven into dreams. Now you see no Jesus Christ comes from without in anybody's visions. No Rama, no Krishna, no Buddha, and no Baba Fakir come from without to anybody. The visions are only because of the impressions and suggestions that a disciple has already accepted in his mind. These impressions and suggestions appear to him like a dream. Nobody comes from without. This is the plain truth. Baba Fakir Chant. What strikes the reader almost immediately after reading both the Bardo Todol and the Unknowing Sage is the remarkable similarity between both texts. Whereas the Bardo Todol is written mostly in second person and third person, listing instructions for the departing soul, the unknowing sage is in the first person, presenting the reader with Fakir Chan's frank autobiographical admissions about his meditative life. Yet, in both texts, the respective philosophies coincide. 1. The Illusory Nature of religious visions. 2. The limitations of knowledge, both rational and transmundane. And 3. The principle that the ego, self, soul is the real cause of man's unenlightened state. How Fakir Chand came to this realization is an interesting story in itself especially for someone steeped in the Radha Swami tradition. From a very early age, Fakir was prone towards mystical experiences, oftentimes seeing religious visions of Krishna and Rama, who would, we are told, instruct Fakir on various aspects of his religious life. Eventually, however, Fakir became so distraught in his quest for God-realization that he became hysterical and stopped eating. As Fakir recollects, Once I wept for 24 hours continuously for a glimpse of the Lord. Doctors were called in. They administered medicine to me. At about five o'clock in the morning, I saw in a vision the form of Maharishi Shiv Brat Lal. Fakir's eventual guru. He drew water from a nearby well and helped me take a bath, and then told me his address in Lahore. This experience convinced me that God had incarnated himself in the form of Maharishi Shiv Brat Lal. Fakir's experience convinced him that Shiv Brat Lal was his master. After ten months of correspondence, Fakir received initiation from his preceptor into the Radha Soami faith in 1905. It was not until the end of World War I, though, that Fakir received his first glimpse of enlightenment. For prior to this time, 1919, Fakir accepted whatever inner sights and sounds he beheld in meditation as true and objective. 
The turning point came after a battle in Hamidia in Iraq. As Fakir Chand recalls, I too was shaken with the fear of death. In this very moment of fear, the holy form of Hazor Datta Dayal Ji appeared before me and said, Fakir, worry not. The enemy has not come to attack, but to take away their dead. Let them do that. Don't waste your ammunition. I sent for the Subadar Major and told him about the appearance of my guru and his directions concerning the enemy. The Subadar Major followed the directions of my guru. The rebel Jawans came and carried away their dead without attacking our positions. By six o'clock in the morning, our airplanes came and they dropped the necessary supplies. Our fears vanished. We gained courage. We were safe. Though Fakir was overjoyed by this miracle, he did not appreciate its full import until some three months later. Fakir realized that this vision was a projection of his own mind. When Fakir asked Shiv Brat Lal about his appearance, the guru said that he knew nothing whatsoever about it. Moreover, around the time Fakir saw the miraculous form of his guru, Fakir's friends were also in danger and prayed to God. But instead of Shiv Brat Lal appearing to them, Fakir Chan's radiant form manifested and saved their lives. When Fakir was informed about this incident, he was wonderstruck. After about three months, the fighting came to an end and the Jawans retired to their barracks. I returned to Baghdad, where there were many satsangis. When they learned of my arrival, they all came together to see me. It was all very unexpected and a surprising scene for me. I asked them, Our guru, Maharaj, is at Lahore. I am not your guru. Why do you worship me? They replied in unison, on the battlefield we were in danger. Death lurked over our heads. You appeared before us in those moments of danger and gave us direction for our safety. We followed your instructions and thus were saved. I was wonderstruck by this surprising explanation of theirs. I had no knowledge of their trouble. I myself, being in danger those days of combat, had not even remembered them. Thus, it was through a series of remarkable events that Fakir began to question the authenticity of his inner visions. Instead of accepting whatever appeared to him during his voyages out of the body, Fakir doubted them and attempted to find the source from which all such visions arise. Fakir's adventures began to dovetail at this point with the underlying philosophy of the Bardo Todol. That all phenomena are transitory, are illusionary, are unreal and non-existent save in the sangsaric mind perceiving them. That in reality there are no such beings anywhere as gods or demons or spirits or sentient creatures, all alike being phenomena dependent upon a cause. That this cause is a yearning or a thirsting after sensation, after the unstable sangsaric existence. Eventually, Fakir dismissed his visionary encounters as nothing but subtle obstructions of Maya. It was at this point that Fakir's meditation took a new turn. Instead of enjoying the bliss of inner sights and sounds, Fakir turned his attention to the source from which these manifestations arose. And in so doing, Fakir no longer became attracted to visions of Krishna, Rama, or even his guru. Shiv Brat Lal. Comments Fakir. O Dial's mother, whom you see within and whom you love within, is your own creation, your own child. You yourself create the image of Shiv Brat Lal in your center of Trikuti, while other devotees create ideals such as Krishna, Rama, or other gods at the same center and enjoy their vision. Man is basically ignorant about the reality. Mother Bhagyawati is not a lonely example. I too suffered many hardships due to this very ignorance. Fakir's insights, interestingly, tally with Book 1 of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. As Evans Wentz comments, 
These deities, manifestations of various gods and goddesses in the intermediate plane, are in ourselves. They are not something apart from us. In this esoteric sense, the lotus order of deities represent the deified principles of the vocal functions of ourselves. In this new chapter in Fakir's spiritual quest, he began to develop a dispassion for anything that arose in his meditation, be it delightful or wrathful. Instead, Fakir began to query, who is it that sees the light? Who is it that hears the sound? In other words, what is it that experiences this world and worlds beyond it? No doubt, Fakir reasoned, it is consciousness. But what is that? wondered Fakir. The answer would haunt Fakir for the rest of his life, for he realized that no matter what spiritual practices he may do, he would never know. It was simply incomprehensible, a mystery without limitation. To Fakir, the haunting aspect about this discovery was that no human being, not even avatars, saints or gurus, he surmised, could possibly know. Indeed, it was this very unknowability that constituted man's enlightenment. Argues Fakir, I do not proclaim that whatever I say is correct or final. Whatever I say is the conclusion of my experience of life. Nature is unfathomable. No one has known it. A small germ in a body cannot know the whole body. Similarly, a human being is like a small germ in a vast creation. How can he claim to have known the entire creation? Those who say that they have known are wrong. No one can describe or even know the entire creation. Up to a certain extent to which man's mind has access, one can say something, but nobody can tell about the entire universe. It is indescribable. Paradoxically, buoyed by this intuition, Fakir began to immerse himself more and more into the clear void light, forgetting himself and his quest in the process. Although Fakir's extraordinary excursions took place while he was still alive, his experiences reinforced the general philosophy of the Bardo Tadol. O oh, son of noble family, listen. Now the pure luminosity of the Dharmata is shining before you. Recognize it. O oh, son of noble family, at this moment your state of mind is by nature pure emptiness. It does not possess any nature whatever. Neither substance or quality such as color, but it is pure emptiness. This is the Dharmata. This mind of yours is inseparable luminosity and emptiness in the form of a great mass of light. It has no birth or death, therefore it is the Buddha of immortal light. To recognize this is all that is necessary. What exactly this emptiness or luminosity is cannot by definition be described. In the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the emphasis is on recognizing one's true nature, that which is nothing in particular, but rather the field in which all things arise, itself being visionless, though producing visions, and itself being a structureless structure. The clear void light is absolutely paradoxical, since the I cannot grasp it nor can the mind by its subject-object dualism conceive it. Ken Wilber, a well-regarded transpersonal theorist and practicing Zen Buddhist, describes it this way. The absolute is both the highest state of being and the ground of being. It is both the goal of evolution and the ground of evolution, the highest of all conditions and the condition of all conditions. Anything less than that paradox generates either pantheistic reductionism on the one hand, or wild and radical transcendentalism on the other. 
Thus, Fakir, following his Tibetan counterparts, eschewed even the pure light and sound which was beyond form, and attached himself to no thing allowing himself, as he so astutely put it, to hang on the gallows. But in so doing, Fakir broke with Radha Swami tradition, which advocates Surat Shabd Yoga. Fakir eventually became regarded as a heretic in some circles. Near the end of his life, Fakir grew closer to the philosophical principles of Buddhism, particularly Mahayana, as outlined in the Bardo Todol. Indeed, if one were only to look at his later writings, one would come away with the impression that Fakir came from a lineage of Tibetan lamas. The following passage is particularly relevant in this regard. O oh, Fakir, these satsangis have taught you the method of hanging at the gallows. Only this experience of the manifestation of my form at different places, of which I am never aware, has changed my life. My experiences prove that yogi, meditator, guru, disciple, and even the aspirant of salvation are in bondage. These people who create my form with their mental forces to fulfill their worldly desires are not interested to know the truth. Come to know the nature of your own mind, in which there is no self and no other. Huang Po. They do not hang themselves on the gallows because they depend on the support of my form. Whereas to a man on the gallows, there is no support. This is the highest stage. It is precisely this letting go, both of the objects which entice the mind and the mind itself, which constitutes the final meditation in the Tibetan Book of the Dead. When this is done, no rebirth is possible, since there is no one left to reap experiences. But what happens to those who cannot let go into the clear void light? What is their plight? According to the Bardo Todol, such beings have a series of lesser options, whereby they can take new births in higher or lower dimensions of awareness regions upon regions enjoying the fruits of their karmic actions. Their fall, so to say, from the empty luminosity is due to one simple but devastating mistake. They took the apparitions, the lights, the colors, the sounds, and the sensations of the intermediate plane to be real and not as projections of their own self-created karma. In a phrase, they bought the dream as reality and were thus duped. Concerning these beings, the Tibetan Book of the Dead says, O oh son of noble family, if you do not recognize them, the various lights and apparitions, as your projections, whatever meditation practice you have done during your life, you have not met with this teaching. The colored light will frighten you. The sounds will bewilder you, and the rays of light will terrify you. If you do not understand this essential point of the teachings, you will not recognize the sounds, lights, and rays, and so you will wander in samsara. Fakir Chand also reiterates the teachings of the Bardo Tadal on this issue of karmic propensities. It is the principle that karma sways one away from the clear void light at death if one is not attached beforehand in the empty luminosity. Fakir's frank autobiographical admissions reveal that even a sage as steeped in meditation as he could occasionally fall from the truth and get caught in the whirlpool of attachment. When Fakir Chand went to sleep, he usually attached himself to the light and sound within, but occasionally would get caught up with dreams, falsely believing that he was seeing his father, his son, his wife, trains, and so on. As Fakir points out, This night I had a dream in which I saw running trains. An accident occurred. I carried my luggage. My father, whom I was afraid of, met me ahead. Then I met my mother. My first wife was also sitting there. I inquired from my wife, 
What about your wounded leg? Is your leg now all right? Are you not my wife? Meanwhile, I awoke and attuned myself to the shabd in a sound current. All these deeds, thoughts, and feelings where selfish motives are involved shall positively have their reaction upon the individual concerned, either in the waking state or in sleep. Why do I say so? This is my experience. Ever since the establishment of Manavta Mandir, I have never dreamed about it. Why? Because myself is neither attached to Mandir nor to any of you. But why do my father, mother, wife, and railway trains appear time and again in my dreams? Because myself was attached to them. Fakir's observation of what occurs in the dream state also holds true for what happens in the intermediate plane after death, since both involve the same fundamental rule. Keep calm and be agnostic. Attachment creates repetition, and thus the cycle of samsara continues. Liberation, both in the Tibetan Book of the Dead and in The Unknowing Sage, is non-attachment to anything or anyone. Only then can the bubble or knot of self-existence be undone. When Fakir Chand was asked what would happen to him after death, he frankly remarked, I don't know. When asked to elaborate, he proceeded to give a gist of his entire philosophy of life. Not surprisingly, as I have attempted to point out in this paper, Fakir's outlook echoes almost point by point the Tibetan Book of the Dead. So, what I have understood about Nam is that it is the true knowledge of the feelings, visions and images that are seen within. This knowledge is that all the creations of the waking, dreaming and deep sleep modes of consciousness are nothing but samskaras, impressions which are in truth unreal, that are produced by the mind. What to speak about others, even I am not aware of my own self in dreams. Who knows what may happen to me at the time of death? I may enter the state of unconsciousness, enter the state of dreams, and see railway trains. How can I make a claim about my attainment of the ultimate? The truth is that I know nothing. Evans Wentz, writing some 40 years earlier than Fakir, makes the following observation concerning the Bardo to Dol. It is not necessary to suppose that all the dead in the intermediate state experience the same phenomena, any more than all the living do in the human world or in dreams. As a man is taught, so he believes. In the end, Fakir's death was an untypical one. In April of 1981, he installed his spiritual successor, Dr. I.C. Sharma, at Manavta Mandir, Hoshiarpur, and then proceeded to fly to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in the United States to conduct his fifth world tour. He was 95 years old, but just prior to departing from the Delhi airport, Fakir was asked in a tape-recorded meeting by a longtime friend and devotee when he would be coming back. Fakir, in an unusually prophetic reply, responded, When I come back, it will be in a black box. And so it was. Several weeks later in a Pittsburgh hospital, Fakir, after undergoing a cardiac arrest and suffering in a coma for several days, died. Days later, his body was sent back to India in a casket for final cremation rites. One can only wonder if the unknowing sage melted into the empty luminosity or into the dream world of running trains.